So I started out uh, with the topic of science education, and, and then I started uh, writing down thoughts, you know, conveying what I know from the front line in science education, and, and it was like all these sort of uh, negative things. And I said to myself, I, I don't want to spend my time talking about that. And I was thinking about the hook for the, for the talk, and, and I think maybe it was because I was reading a book about Stanley Kubrick at the time, but you know, these things, synchronicity comes together, and I, and I thought about, well, I'm, I really, day to day, don't worry about science education. You know? I'm doing something about it, and I think maybe that's why I don't worry about it. So I, I decided to title it Science Education, or How I Stopped Worrying and Came to Love a National Crisis. So, I have one plot um, in the whole talk, uh, but this is the plot, and it's an important one. It was uh, made by a, a colleague of mine, Tony Pyro, who's uh, also an astrophysicist. Uh, he writes a blog uh, called Calamities of Nature, and he has uh, web comics there. And he often gets very insightful, and, and, and this plot um, sticks out. Even before I describe any of these axes, we're looking at countries. And there's one country kind of lonely by itself out there in this, uh, what a scientist would call parameter space. What are we looking at? We're looking at a measure of the percent of the public that believes in evolution. Uh, measured by just asking the question, do you believe, uh, true or false, human beings as we you know developed from an earlier species of animals. And the other axis here uh, is about gross domestic product per capita, or some level of affluence, or perhaps some level of access to education. And what we see is that the fundamental discovery, and I, this pains for me to say this as an astrophysicist, but probably the preeminent discovery in science has been this history of humanity as a species and this living world we live on that has a change from generation to generation through this process called evolution. And when we look at this plot and see that normally when you're more educated by some metric, or at least more wealthy, you have learned this seminal fact in science. And this is broader than this. I wanted to point this out because it, it relates to things we've heard today, climate change. Right? Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I don't even have to talk about climate change in astronomy class. I can just tell them about greenhouse gases, science that we've known forever. And if people are unwilling or unable to get the information to believe these central tenets of science, this rigorous way of getting more and more truthful models of the way the world works, then we have a real disconnect between what drives us as a society, our ability to uh, create, our ability to live harmoniously with the environment, our ability to have a, a burgeoning economy, with, for some reason, our ability to say those same things that can lead us on these paths, this scientific innovation, we are not trusting it. And that's the problem, and I could go into many more plots and the thing that turned me into a, a science educator rather than a day-to-day -day research scientist. But this plot points out a real disconnect we have in this country. So I started thinking about why this is, and, and the anecdote for me is that I, I will one out of four times I'm at a party and I introduce myself and I say, oh, I'm a physicist. One out of four times. The response I get, not dissimilar from that face, but is one that says, oh, physics, I hated that class. <laughs> and I say to myself, wow, what is it that I did? It's not like I'm a lawyer or anything. <laughs> and I thought about it in, in, in connection with this, and, it, and it's often followed up. I ask, okay, you know, why, why did you not like physics? And they say, well, it was, it was hard. And I said, I, you know, so I'm thinking about this. Okay, it's, it's hard. What I do is hard. Yeah, that's good. I do something that's difficult to do. No, no, I thought about it, and it's almost ironic. Why is it hard? Science is this, this way of putting together and understanding the world around us. We are a naturally inquisitive species. I mean, we're here today, right, to hear different voices and put it together for our own meaning for the world. And so I think it's kind of funny that people find 
science hard when we're naturally inquisitive, why we are natural pattern matchers. We look at things like clouds and see faces in them. But we, you know, we look at the world around us and start to bring, uh, build mental models. So that's what I want to talk about, mental models. People build this. This is innate in us. And we build these models of how the world works. I ask my students to say, well, which ways do you use things that are similar to the process of science in your ordinary life? And I usually get three answers when I kind of go into what is science and, and, and talking about this. And I say, well, it seems like cooking. You know, I, I, I experiment, I put things together, and it tastes good or it tastes bad. And they say it's like sports. I need to get better at it. I need to make an estimate as to how the goalie is going to behave. Or they also say it's like dating, where they're building a mental model of, of who would be the right match for them. And, and I look at that and say, well, that's what we do. This is a really useful thing. This is like science. And yet when we're in a science class, they're uncomfortable with it. So, these models are often useful, but, um, but they're often incorrect. So we have a mental model for how things move, right? A skateboard, we're out there. But our model can be right 99 times out of a 100. But if it's wrong that one time out of 100, then it's not the correct model. It's not the correct model for how I expect motion when I move across the room. It's not the correct model in terms of what I look for in a mate. And so it is, in fact, science. And the difficulty with science is that we always have to be willing to tear down those ideas and build it again. And so students come into a physics class, and they say, I have a model for the way the world works. This is great. And then they take something like the force concept inventory, something that we use as science educators to say, are you getting these concepts of physics? And they don't do well on it at all. And they're like, this is hard. No, when something moves, it moves like this. I see it happen all the time. So I try to tell them that this is not, you're not alone. When you have these feelings like, my mental model should work, and it doesn't, science is hard. Well, no smaller a mind than Aristotle understood how the world works. Things tend to come to a stop. Motion ends. All things end stopping. But this was wrong. You know, many times we throw something up. What does it do? It comes down, lands, and stops. So that's our, our understanding of how the world works. So the difficulty isn't that we're pattern matchers. It's that we go out there and we have to be comfortable when we're learning science that the pattern that you have already built might not be the underlying true patterns of how the world works. So Aristotle had this idea. It was something no more fundamental than Newton's first law, which you probably have all heard of here, which is an object in motion stays in motion. As a scientist, I say, well, I want to say it's with a constant velocity. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? That's a, uh, a speed and a direction. Unless it is acted upon by an external force. And so this explains the world in a more accurate way. But why does it matter? It matters. The correct model matters because it allows us to do the things that we can do. We can't be right 99 times out of 100 for the things that really matter. If we're going to reach the pinnacle of human achievement, here a picture of the International Space Station taken by the space shuttle, as if to underscore where we are in science education, which is we built this space shuttle. We have no really manned program to speak of at this point. We are in a national crisis about our ability and our determination to do these things. Here's our ability to understand how an object in motion remains in motion, except acted upon by a force, means that we can build the International Space Station. It goes beyond that. And as an astronomer, something I love to talk about 
is where it's way beyond our ordinary, everyday ideas of how the world works. This is Einstein saying gravity doesn't work the way we expect it to. Coming up with a better understanding of how gravity works, changing the very shape of space, something you and I can't have experience with in this room, and yet we can build a model and it's better and more accurate and allows GPS. We could not find our way around with our cell phones without this science or better understanding of the universe. Here we see a picture of galaxies very far away and even more distant galaxies. The more distant galaxies images are distorted through something only predicted through Einstein's relativity. These arcs, these shapes are even more distant galaxies looking like you're looking through the bottom of a wine glass. And you can see these shapes. I want to bring it closer to home and put a little bit of my work in here. It's not only that, it's technical innovation. And I work in an area called adaptive optics, where we are able to take an image, something like this. We used to be able to see a galaxy like this, a collection of stars very, very far away. But we were left with a blur in the center of that image. It's too many stars together, our atmosphere too turbulent that it makes it blurry. And in a field that I work in, I work with microelectromechanical devices, mirrors that we shape. I work with control systems on computers. I work with things that sense the path of light. All built together to do this work that I did with a graduate student at the University of California, Santa Cruz, which is to, to work with this adaptive optics system and peer into that center region and be able to see something blown up here that we never saw before, which was these collections of stars being born in this region near the center of that galaxy, near a supermassive black hole. So for me, the correct model matters. That's why science matters, that we're able to break our previous conceptions of how the world works. And with that comes these abilities to do new and amazing things. So I wanted my talk to be about the positive things, because that's what I, what I find that I do every day. It's positive. I'm there with students. This is a, not a picture of students, but a picture of a community of scientists who along the way to their research positions got involved with a program at uh, UC Santa Cruz, the Professional Development Program, part of a National Science Foundation funded center for adaptive optics, where these scientists were brash who come in there and they're going to teach us about things. And they taught us that we actually know how people learn. People study this. Well, I didn't study this, but as a scientist, I respected this. And all of a sudden I said, really? I could be a better teacher than the way I thought about it as a graduate student and a TA and I just used my intuition to find out what I should do? Yes. We know how people best learn. You should use those techniques. It was so amazing to me and to many of the people in this cohort that in my particular instance, I changed my career path. I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be boots on the ground in undergraduate classes. I wanna work with students, I wanna do authentic science, but I want the teaching to come first. That's what we have with Sonoma State University here in our county. So what do I do? I want to give you some examples of this research that I got pointed to in actually a National Research Council uh, book called How People Learn. Metacognition. I shouldn't be just teaching them the facts about physics, especially when we see that our intuition is going to, going to make us not want to listen to the way the world really works. I need to build up their process here, students in my class, talking to each other in the class because they need to learn the process of evaluating their own learning process, metacognition, thinking about thinking. It's not that I'm in this class and I need to learn the order of the planets. I need to learn the underlying physical processes and I need to monitor, am I learning that material? And the key one, which you probably heard, it's a buzzword in science education, inquiry. And I've heard lots of different descriptions, but the best one is learning science as science is practiced. It is this thing where you put yourself out on the line and your hypothesis can be wrong. It can be broken and you have to come to a better understanding. So students such as Blaine Gilbreth here who's working, uh, who's worked with me these past uh, couple of years at Sonoma State, he's out there working on a way for other students to learn about my adaptive optics. 
He's worked with me on that, and I want him to build up an apparatus where other students can come in and learn how this is done. So when I think about it and the solution, I think about the two ways that I can help, and I'm going to talk about how we can help, but the two ways that I can help. One is I'm proud that we have this really fine institution with a, with a long history of a liberal arts education. Thank you. We've got an opportunity to be the last science class that anybody ever takes as they go off into all their different majors and, and different career paths. I need for them, if they've never had it before, to know the process of science. So when they read the newspaper and they hear about climate change, when they read about it and hear about how people say maybe evolution doesn't happen, they need to know where the science comes from and what the science process is so these ideas are vetted. The other place that I have a role is in mentorship, it is taking students that are going to go off to become educators. Here, Ryan Leland, who is already off in the photovoltaic industry, working with me with a concentrator for sunlight to add it to, to send it to a, a photovoltaic uh, device. The idea that we're part of the solution. So the mentorship is these students, the ones that come through our physics program, need to be, learn these skills of science, learn to be able to present their information here in our student research seminar, learn how to distill their ideas, and something that we take to heart. But that's what we do. And so I want to leave us with some final thoughts about this. I, I could have gone into much more detail that science education is crucial to our future, our technical future, our future as a informed society to vote and make decisions, and I could spend more time talking about the crisis and how we're defunding this and defunding that and not respecting teaching and education in all the ways that I could. But I want to point out and, and, and really to hit a point that we've already heard, let's stop worrying about it. I don't actually spend my day to day worrying about it because I'm doing what I can. And everyone can, in their own way, tackle what they can. It can be an attitude towards science. It can be visiting a K through 12 classroom if you're in a technical field and giving them an idea that, oh, science is something I can learn and do something amazing with. So I leave you with a challenge to tackle what you can. And I leave you with the idea that the next time you come across a, a problem where your mental model has broken down, you don't curse the world for not behaving the way you want it to. You go ahead and you figure out how it actually works. Thank you.